Hello. On behalf of the University of Dundee, I would like to welcome you to our second seminar in our Festival of the Future COP26 series focusing on food. My name is Dr. Alexandra Morell, and I'll be chairing what we hope will be a far reaching and informative discussion this afternoon. We'll be touching on topics related to food production, nutrition, and well being. Although challenges facing our food system under a rapidly changing climate encompass much more. Our food system is relatively unique among the topics we are discussing in this seminar series, as it includes these grand concepts like internationally traded commodities, global climate mitigation and adaptation, as well as the deeply personal relationships we have between food and our bodies, our cultures and our communities. The projections around climate change and its impacts are dire and food production and distribution are expected to be significantly impacted. It can certainly be easy to feel overwhelmed or disheartened. However, what we as researchers, students and members of the public need to remember is that climate change is driven by our systems, chiefly emissions from the energy, transport and agricultural sectors, and these operate at a larger scale than we as individuals. And therefore, our responses need to be coordinating from the individual to the systemic level. No one is expected to do this alone. We have an opportunity as we look to reduce the carbon footprint of our diets and transition to more climate resilient methods of cultivation to ensure we are managing our landscapes with biodiversity in mind, strengthening our community connections and social infrastructure around principles of well-being, and that we are centering our needs, including that of farmers, when making any necessary adjustments. These are certainly not simple tasks and they do require engagement from everyone. Hence, we have such a prestigious and varied panel of experts to guide us in this discussion. I'll take some time now to introduce all of the speakers to maximize our time for questions and allow for an ample panel discussion. I'm thrilled to be able to welcome Professor Derek Stewart, based just down the road from us in Invergowrie. He is the business sector leader for agri-food at the James Hutton Institute. He has over 30 years of experience and more than 170 peer-reviewed publications in the fields of crop production, plant metabolics, and human health benefits of a plant-based diet. He'll be presenting some of his latest work on more climate resilient cultivation strategies that can be implemented in Scotland. He offers our audience a very grounded perspective of the realities of our food production, the opportunities we have to adapt, as well as the challenges we still face. I certainly encourage our audience to take advantage of this opportunity to ask any burning questions in those areas. Following Professor Stewart, I'm so excited to have Dr. Beverly Searle, a human geographer focused on social policy and a colleague of mine at the University of Dundee. She is deeply embedded in many social enterprises and engagement initiatives within Dundee and across Scotland, exploring concepts of subjective well-being and how this can inform our attitudes and behaviour. She will be drawing connections between her broader work and our relationship with food and the food system. With Dr. Searle, we have the benefit of her groundbreaking interdisciplinary work that can inform our understanding of why we do or do not adapt, adopt beneficial actions. Again, I urge the audience to make these connections with Dr. Searle and ask her some challenging questions following her presentation. Finally, it is such an honor to have Professor Jenny McDermott, who is Professor of Sustainable Nutrition and Health and the Interim Director of the Interdisciplinary Challenge Health, Nutrition and Wellbeing from the University of Aberdeen with us. Professor McDermott does have a connection with the University of Dundee, having previously researched chocolate and eating behaviors during her time here. Currently, her research focuses on food and nutrition security, as well as the impacts of diet on climate change and land use. She is also a member of the Food and Agriculture Organization and World Health Organization International Science Committee concerned with the UN Dietary Guiding Principles for Sustainable and Healthy Diets and the International Union of Nutritional Sciences Task Force on Sustainable Diets. Again, we have a world-class expert here to present her far-reaching work that addresses both international and human health perspectives. I certainly look forward to the questions from the audience for Professor McDermott. The format for today's event will have each speaker presenting their work for 15 minutes, followed by five minutes of questions. Please feel free to post your questions to the chat as they occur to you, as they will be moderated by my colleagues and made visible for each speaker's allotted time. Following all three speakers, we will have a more open panel discussion where you can ask questions to individual speakers or more general questions or interested they all address. As chair, I will do my best to ensure that all audience questions are asked and that panel members will be able to ask each other questions as well. So with that, I thank everyone for your time and attention and I'll be handing over to Professor Derek Stewart. Okay, we're ready to go. First slide. Um, ah, there we are. Okay, so good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to talk to you about new routes to food security. 
Um, it's always worthwhile contextualising the area we're talking about, and it's become abundantly clear, at least from the science level, that the uh, what the science is telling us, for example, from the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, is that if we do nothing, by 2050, we'll have between 12 and 40 percent of the Earth's land surface will have novel climates. And so if you're growing anything, whether it be animals or crops, that's not good news. You can't guarantee one year to the next. And of course, as those climates are changing, we're seeing populations increasing and needing fed, so it becomes more difficult. Next slide, please. Um, bringing the timeline forward a bit to 2030, where we've still got a population increase, um, the figures for that suggest actually by that point, we will need 50% more food uh, and energy, probably about the same with water, um, and we'd obviously need the land to grow that in to, to allow that to be produced. But essentially what we've done over the last period is trash the land. So we have a lot of soil erosion and biodiversity loss. So we've got an increasing demand and a diminishing resource to grow it on. Um, so how do we square that? Next slide, please. So what does it mean in real terms? So uh, I'm a crop scientist. Um, you have to say that term carefully and don't get that one wrong. Um, so what we have here is two different climates. We've got the one on the left is the existing climate where we've got uh, different uh, different proportions of weather or temperature. And what's happening with climate change is we're shifting to a warmer temperature. But what's also happening is that curve you're seeing is broadening out. And so that what that means is that when you would normally harvest your crops, it's spreading that timeline for crop harvest, which means your productivity goes down, your quality goes down which means there's a huge impact then on the process supply chain. So your, your ability to deliver food in, without doing anything with regard to climate change is incredibly compromised. Next slide, please. And of course, it's not all about primary productions. People's perceptions and what they want to eat is changing. So this was in the BBC recently reporting a paper. Uh, apologies that I've forgotten who the authors are. But essentially what they're saying is over the last decade or so, there's been a 17% reduction in meat consumption. So people are voting with their pounds. Um, but if they're diminishing meat, they're then wanting, they have to supplement their diet some other way or they're wanting alternative foods. And if we're wanting to do that sustainably, we, we have to then harvest the sea or the land or both. So how do we do that? Next slide, please. So one of the ways of doing that is um, an area that I'm uh, leading an innovation flagship on. Um, so this is a, a large uh, initiative called the Advanced Plant Growth Centre, logo on the T-shirt, um, and it's a £27 million, £27 million pound regional development fund to bring together industry and academia to develop precise and controlled environment technologies. So we're looking to see if we could control the environment with regard to growing crops. So this could be anything from polytunnels to glass houses to vertical farms. And I'll tell you more about that as we progress. Next slide, please. So within the Advanced Plant Growth Centre is where we would see the innovation uh, hothouse, where we can see industry and academia coming together. Um, it's got four pillars. So you've got vertical farming, which is the poster child, and more a bit more of that later. We've got next generation controlled environments, and this is a really truly scientific approach where we can dial in future climates and environments and see how today's crops would grow in them. We know they would fail, but we need to know why they fail. What that allows us to then do is design the next generation of crops so they don't fail when we get to that timeline point. So we're thinking ahead in future proofing. We're also building what's called a high throughput phenotyping platform. Essentially, this is a, a robotic based sensor based characterization system so we can look at plant populations really fast and create the next generation of crops quickly. And of course, the Cinderella of this area is post harvest research, crop storage. We don't harvest everything and eat it all at one time. We have to keep it stored someplace. Uh, and this is an area that's not really attracted much innovation, and we're going to be doing a lot on that to look at sustainable ways to store crops. This is particularly important in, in the developing world where they will lose 30 to 40 percent of a crop because they can't store it. Next slide, please. We plug, this is what the new building is going to look like, so we hope to see you all there once it's launched. Thank you very much. Next slide. Right, so if we're talking about controlled environment, um, you've probably seen the lovely glass houses, the old Victorian glass houses around the UK or actually around the world. So that's bottom left on that picture. Um, and they were powered uh, essentially by coal, feed, 
coal that were coal that was feeding steam boilers and the steam boilers were then heating the last houses. This essentially system stayed up until about the 60s, to be brutally honest. But but after the Second World War, we got mass production and assembly line systems coming in and electric light into the glass houses. What we've had in probably about the last decade is the input of computers and automation in controlled environment systems. Again, could be polytunnels, glass houses, vertical farms. But more lately, what we've seen is linking all these things up to in, um, Internet of Things approaches. So we're putting sensors in there, which means we can control these things by a remote uh, and reduce the ingress of humans into the growth systems. Because when humans interact with plants, then invariably they will bring in disease from outside. So you want to reduce that. Next slide, please. So we've got these four areas I told you about. Well, let's skip ahead to the next slide, please. A key point worth bearing in mind, and I left this to the middle to bang home a point is, um, I've said earlier we're needing a lot more food, but actually the, the, the social classes is changing over time as well. So they reckon by 2030, because of the evolution of countries, we'll see 3 billion more middle class consumers coming in and they will have money to burn and spend. So it won't be a simple, OK, we'll eat less livestock and we'll grow more plants because the newly emergent middle classes will want meat as well. Um, so the social aspects from this become very interesting, but we still have to feed everyone. Um, and some of them may want actually to go down a very plant based diet. So we have to be able to grow plants quite intensively while not damaging the environment. Next slide, please. Just to give you a feel for the value of the industry, um, Lots of data in this one. One key point, if you look at agriculture on this, agriculture represents 4% of the global GDP, $3.2 trillion. This is, this is not a number that people think of when they think of agriculture. They think of a farmer with dungarees, boots, mud on his boots and dirty hands. That's quite the reverse. It's quite a high tech industry. So if we even crunch it down to horticulture, which was traditionally glasshouse based systems, that's, 30, that's a 30 billion pound industry. And over the last couple of years, vertical farming has exploded out of that to create a 4 billion pound industry. And these will these are probably going to accelerate on a double uh, a double uh, double digit growth per year area over the next 10 years. Um, so we can see it's a high value industry and particularly now with the focus away from livestock and towards plant based systems, horticulture and vertical farming is becoming very key. Next slide, please. So who's interested in this area? This is an interesting slide that came from Oxfam that sort of uh, broke down the big food producers in the world and every one of the big ones in the middle are interested in controlled environment agriculture. Having spoken to, spoken to some of them, they would happily move away from many of their feedstocks from farming on the land to farming onto much more controlled environments because what that affords them is consistent quality in their products. And it also offers the opportunity to raise bars so this could be raising the quality in terms of uh, taste and texture. But importantly, some of the research we found already, we can actually raise the nutritional level. We can raise micronutrients if we want to look at zinc and selenium, for example, or actually look at vitamin lifts through controlled environment. Um, so those, those 10 major companies and all their peripheral companies could potentially be buyers or off takers of feedstocks from uh, controlled environment agriculture. Next slide. So what does the shift mean if we go from uh, control from field to co controlled environment? Well, if you're outside, the sun goes up and the sun goes down. There's the simple piece. And with it, you get a fixed different set of wavelengths as it goes. So what we have to do is to be able to create that inside. And in fact, we can do that and have shown to do that inside already. But what that then offers up is because we control the temperature, what the plant wants to eat, the gases it needs, so we can increase the CO2 levels to allow them to respire. Um, and the nutrients, so we can completely control that. And by doing that, we can speed up how fast plants grow, or if we're working to a just-in-time food provision system, slow them down. Um, and you'll have seen, if you're in the UK and listening to this, you, if you've been into your local supermarket, you'll have seen there are real problems in fresh produce supply. There's big gaps. If we go to a controlled environment, we would have buffers to play to, to allow us to work with those gaps. Next slide, please. So by playing around with the lights, and you can he see here just that there's some same herbs there, and we played around with blue, green, and red lights, and you can see just on visual how much we can change 
the, the quality of the crop. And with that change in quality, we've seen changes in uh, vitamin content uh, and um, sensory experience. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. OK, so what we're also working with are local companies, so it's not all working with the big guys. We're working with um, SMEs and actually micro companies right the way through to allow them to enter into this business and, and create a sustainable food system. So in this case, we're working with a, a one that's local to uh, both my institute and Dundee University um, who produce strawberries. They actually produce strawberries that go into Marks and Spencers. Next slide, please. So what we've seen with this is we were able to manipulate um, what's called anthocyanin. So if you've got a strawberry or actually a raspberry or any of these other berries, the red colour and the blue colours are called anthocyanins. Um, so we can manipulate the levels of those by playing around with the lights and there is no impact on other components of the fruit. Um, so that means we can make it more appealing, but, but these anthocyanins when digested uh, go down and they impact positively on colonic bacteria. So these, we can make these strawberries actually good for your gut and increasingly the research coming out is your health, the health of your colon and the bacteria in there have a huge impact on many other factors in the body. So potentially we could be making, I'm loath to say healthier for you fruit, but the, but the, the, the potential is there to manipulate that. Next slide please. So the other things we work on are, uh, I think we're working on about 200 different species of crops. Uh, one of these is basil. Basil seems, a, you may think basil is a niche one, but basil is about 40% of the herb market. So it's a key commercial crop. So by playing around with the lights, we were able to manipulate uh, the, the, the weight of the stem on the basil, uh, the mass of the plant, the leaf weight, the stem length. So basically everything with regard to crop physiology. Now remember, this is not genetic manipulation. It's not gene editing. We can do many things without going down that route, but we will. We may still yet do that. But just by manipulating the environment, you can really play around with a crop and manipulate most traits that it has and most of the traits that you as a consumer would, would perhaps like. Next slide. Uh, next slide as well. And the next one. I'd forgotten these fly-ins, my apologies. So we're also working on crops outside. So because you've got this controlled environment system, what we can do is use it as a research tool. And this is where we've used it here. Potato is the fourth top food crop in the world. Um, and if you actually, well actually it's the third, um, sugar cane, I wouldn't really count that as a food crop. So it's the third in the world. It's, it's exploding in terms of its uptake in places like China, Africa and India. The problem is if you're growing them in many of those countries, their high temperatures impact on yield. So because we've got this controlled environment as a research tool, we can play around and, and identify the genes that are really good for allowing potato to grow at a higher temperature. And this is exactly what's happened. And we're now looking at producing potatoes that grow fantastically well in sub-Saharan Africa, areas where simple things like calorie intakes are restricting factors. So we've now got fantastically tasting potatoes that will grow under their conditions, all based on the ability to manipulate the environment it's then allowed us to identify the genes we need to breed into the next generation. Next slide, please. So climate change comes with a certain consequences on carbon footprint. Um, vertical farming, you just need to throw a stick at the media and you'll see lots of that at the moment. If you have a vertical farm and essentially you're plugging it into the grid and it's a coal fired grid, it's not, it's a great system for producing food. Um, but it's an expensive energy system for doing so, and it's and it's um, CO2 emissions are fairly substantial. But if you look at that top graph, if you use renewable energy, and that's where we've got the green vertical farm, it, it trumps all the other routes for crop production, certainly for horticultural crops as well. Um, so that's the way forward that we're chasing at the moment. And Scotland is a place to do it. It's fantastic because you're currently running, many of the times running on 100% renewable energy every day. So that's the place where we will develop this as a, a viable model to run elsewhere. Here we've got wind and hydro, Saudi Arabia or in the African nations or Australia, you would use solar. Other places it would be wind. I mean, theoretically, you could grow basil in Siberia using wind power on a vertical farm. So it opens up huge opportunities. The productivity aspects of vertical farms sell themselves. So if you think of just for one kilogram, a couple of heads of lettuce, if you do it in a field, it takes you 250 litres of water. A vertical farm needs one litre. And most of that one litre is going into the plant when you think about it. The yields are phenomenal in vertical farms. 
um, probably about 30 fold compared to open field. And if you could build these vertical farms, and they're fairly simple, some of them, in positions where you need them, your food miles diminish. So the UK is importing huge levels of uh, these horticultural crops in places like Spain and the Mediterranean that are becoming very water scarce. So we can eliminate those food miles and import substitution and grow them locally and grow them locally 24 7 365. Next slide please. So this is kind of what the next generation food production system will probably look like where you've access to renewable energy. So the big sort of hatched bit in the centre could be plastic tunnels, glass houses, vertical farms, fully powered with LED lights that are hyper efficient, which means we can play around with the wavelength and hence the environment for the crop. But it could be fueled by multiple different things. It could be turbines, hydropower. Um, if you site them in areas uh, where there used to be coal mining, you put cold water down the coal mine and you, the, when the water comes back up again, it's probably 40 degrees warmer. So by using heat exchangers, you can exchange that temperature differential into electricity and fuel, uh, fuel these systems. Also, there's lots of amount of CO2 down the holes, down the mine holes. If you take the CO2 out and pump it into the growing systems, the plants love more CO2. They get bigger and fatter and more luxurious. So we can strip in this waste energy and CO2 and use it productively and use the plants essentially as um, CO2 sinks. Next slide, please. So across my mind, it's not just primary production we need to think about, it's our behaviours and how we use food. So we need to consider what's called the circular economy. Basically, instead of using something and throw it away, there's probably wastage along, along the way in production. How do we use that? And can we use it in food? Well, we can. So next slide, please. Just to let you know, Derek, we're about a minute left. That's okay? fine, we'll go about that. So um, in this one, what we've looked at is looked at if you're processing oilseed rate for oil, you've left with this pulp that generally feed to animals. So what we've been able to do is strip protein out of that and convert it very simply into uh, a protein that has gluten like properties, but none of the allergenicity. So we can put the bounce back into gluten free bread, which if any of you have tried it, it is really disappointing and unappealing. So that opens up opportunities all along there. Next slide. Um, similarly, if we're going to a plant protein economy, we need to we'll probably eat more beans. Beans will create waste. So you've got the shell around the bean, which could be dietary fibre for bread. You've got different processing fractions that can become fish food, or you've got a starchy fraction that, frankly, we can brew beer from, and we have done already. It's a no waste crop. Next slide. I'll skip this one due to time then. Next slide. So you can see that even from waste, there are huge areas where we can start to impact either back into the food chain or for other alternative uses. And finally, we've got hidden wastes that can help us produce food. Next slide. For many of our systems, we produce heat and CO2. So if we build vertical farms next to areas that have got excess heat and CO2, for example, next to a hospital, so the hospital boiler, has got CO2 and heat coming out of it, we can scrub the noxious gases out, pump them into a vertical farm and put highly nutritious food back into the patients in that system. So not only are we talking about producing food, this is all about city design and how we create our future going forward. And that's me. Thank you very much, Derek. That is an amazing amount of work um, that you've been, been doing. And we're getting some really uh, interesting questions. Um, I'm gonna summarize two and hopefully you don't mind. Um, okay. So there's one question around sort of maybe describing a bit more what um, vertical farm is and and how is the water use so low and then another one that's sort of around the um you know how um there's not much if you're controlling the pathogens coming in you know you maybe you're missing out on some of the microbiology or the soil microbiome that could be beneficial perhaps. yeah okay so uh, what's a vertical farm it's farming in three dimensions so if you think about um so one of the companies we're working with at the moment um if they have a tree so you you, you can grow them like stack trays imagine you've got shelving in your shed you put LED lights under them and you grow the plants on that one. So it's stacking. It's as simple as that. That's the most simple vertical farm you have and you can make it much more complex and efficient as you grow bigger. So that's the 3D plant. Why is it so efficient on water? Well, when you add the water, what you do is um, the plant will soak it up and you collect what's not used and then you can recycle, recycle that, sterilize it and feed it back in again. Um, so we have a large vertical farm here on site with a company that spun into us. Um, 
And the, the equivalent essentially is a, for one metre squared in a vertical farm, it represents about one to 200 metres squares in a field. But that field, you usually only get maybe one or two harvests. If you're in a vertical farm, you can probably get six to eight harvests. So the productivity goes up. Uh, what was the other one? Oh, pathogen. Yeah. So what we're also looking at is adding, um, manipulating the microbiome we would put into plants uh, to allow them to do what they would do outside. So the vertical farm can be used to produce food or it can be used to produce plantlets that then would be grown outside as well. So it's, it's, it's not a binary system. It's one that fits within the existing infrastructure. Great. Um, I think in the interest of time, we might um, maybe collect some more questions okay. if there's anyone else coming and then we'll we'll, we'll move on to, to Dr. Beverly Searle. But thank you very much, okay. um, Professor Stewart. It was really, really informative. Make sure I don't do the rookie mistake of leaving myself on mute. Um, thank you. Um, I'll just wait for my slides to be loaded. Um, while that's happening, um, I'm interested in, um, I'm going to take a sort of slightly away from food initially um, to think about um, mindsets really and the kind of um, way that we need to think about our behaviour and, and, and how we might need to change our behaviour and that's influenced by um, all sort of well-being and thought processes. So I might take us a little bit away from food initially, but I will I will be bringing us back to the um, subject. Um, hopefully everybody can see that now. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, please. And the next, please. So um, we know that we're damaging the environment. Um, we're digging it up, we're filling it in. We're burning it down, we're polluting waterways and airways, and we're generally creating conditions that are not conducive to growing food. Next, please. So we know that we need to um, change. Get the next one, please. There we go. So we know that we need to change our behaviour. Um, but this is difficult and this is because behaviour is influenced by many uh, individual and systemic factors. And one of the factors that I focus on is mindsets and, and an ability to think differently. Next please. So for me, the underpinning of this is subjective well-being and how this influences our mindsets. Research shows us that low well-being, low subjective well-being is paralysing. And this is because people of low well-being tend to um, have more short-term thinking and um, they tend to focus quite understandably on their immediate uh, problems and they don't have the capacity or the energy to think about broader social or environmental issues. They've also got what's called an external focus of control and this is the idea that they believe things happen to them, that they don't have um, as much control over their lives, that there are powerful others that control uh, what happens in their lives. And they therefore don't feel they have the um, uh, power really to, to, to enact change or to bring about change. And because of this, they tend to think, well, you know, if I can't make changes, then, then why should I even bother trying? So it kind of ties in with this uh, sense of, of helplessness. Um, by contrast, though, um, high subjective well-being. High well-being um, tends to be associated with um, people being able to um, be sort of more forward looking focused. They can be more creative, more imaginative and have the capacity or the ability to think about not just about the future, but um, alternate possible futures. And people with high well-being um, are also uh, associated with having higher levels of self-esteem, and confidence. And this again is important because um, it means that people are, are willing to make um, changes. They're not they're not afraid of, of failure. Um, and those with high well-being are also more likely to have um, an internal locus of control. So this is where they believe they have the capacity or the power uh, to, to affect what happens to them to a certain extent anyway. So they can believe that they can make a difference. Um, and all this then is associated with a sense of hope. That yet? Yeah? Right, I can't see anybody else now, so hopefully this yep. is going to be okay. Great, thank you. We can see that clearly. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so 
the research that I'm involved with then is I'm trying to look at how um, well-being um, is influences people's um, willingness to make changes or the, the, the extent to which that they can enact change. And I'm using data based on a question that asks people, um, it's not worth me doing things to help the environment if others do not do the same. And I'm interested in the people who strongly disagree with this. Now, this is quite challenging because it's kind of a double negative, but basically it's, it's the people who think, yes, actually it is worth me making uh, doing things to change the environment. I don't really care what anybody else is doing. I can still make that change. What I expected to find based on previous uh, literature is that I expected the, these people who, who do think we can make change, these change oriented people would have positive levels of well-being, that that would be linked to them feeling the hope and, and thinking it's worthwhile ma making changes and that they would have low levels of distress um, as part of this kind of higher well-being uh, positioning. But what I didn't expect to find and what's coming through from the research is that they actually also have higher levels of distress as well. Um, so this combination together then, I'm interpreting this as, um, as that people are, um, as having the motivation to act is coming from uh, compassion, from care and concern about the environment that is actually uh, making them feel quite distressed or, or distraught about what is happening. But this is coupled with this positive well-being, which is giving people um, the hope really in the sense to know that uh, change is not only possible, but it's worthwhile as well. So for me then, well-being is not just about personal, how a person feels, but it's also a philosophy for living, um, a new narrative uh, for thinking in different ways. And this starts with a shift in mindsets um, about how we learn reflecting on how we make sense of the world in the first place and part of this is about understanding the rules and structures in society not only connected to the issue or problems that we're interested in um, but how we are guided or bounded by those rules and structures as well which become embedded in ours and others beliefs and perceptions and well-being is important for this process for two reasons one is that being able to change your beliefs or behaviors does require a certain level of well-being or self-esteem because essentially um, you're challenging who you are, you're challenging your own identity. The second way is that um, well-being can help us, is it helps us to think differently um, through understanding relational well-being or the relational aspects of how things connect. And understanding how things connect um, or, or sorry, work as a system, helps us to look at problems in a different way, opening up new entry points uh, for solutions. So if we use food as an example of this and, and how we might try to address things like food poverty, if we take um, one example in existence, which is food banks, the premise here is that, that people cannot afford, afford to buy food and therefore um, we need, need to rely on donations. So the rules of a food bank then are really based on an economic worldview that food poverty is based on a lack of money um, and that uh, we need to rely on people need to make donations. So people buy food at a local supermarket, they donate it to a food bank or maybe even the supermarkets themselves may make donations. And that donated food is then redistributed via means testing. So all of this then focus on the individual, the in individual's abil in inability to, to uh, get food and the, and the the circumstances which determines whether or not they're allowed to access this food. So it, this, all this becomes very stigmatizing. And whilst, you know, I, um, I you know, food banks are doing a, a fantastic job and they are helping a lot of people. Really, it's a limited response uh, to a, a much longer term problem. And in many ways, it just reinforces the existing system that it's about uh, people not being able to afford to buy food and how uh, we still need to purchase food. The, the existing systems are in place about how food is uh, made available and distributed. But if we come at the issue from um, a different perspective and a different world view, so instead of focusing on the economics of food poverty, we actually focus on the food itself. We get um, initiatives such as community larders or community fridges with the focus here is about reducing food waste. And this recognizes then that food poverty is linked to the production and the distribution of food and the waste within the system itself. This kind of approach then is, is more universal. It's open to everyone because anybody can access food from a community larder. The whole community be benefits and therefore it becomes less stigmatizing. It's also about making the connections locally between food suppliers and redistributors. So community larders then take us into a different way of thinking and acting. 
But the next step then is actually changing how we think about things, um, is to remove the need for this type of redistribution for actually correcting the inequality that's been created by setting up new systems that don't create that kind of inequality in the first place, that enable a fair and just distribution uh, right from the outset. But we can only do this by thinking about the relational aspects, about what the system um, what the system looks like um, and how the systems operate. And one example of systems thinking approach in action is via the concept of bioregioning and bioregioning mapping. So I was involved in an initiative in the, in the first round of a bioregioning programme, which included two Scottish regions, one here in, in Tayside and the other over on the west of Scotland at the Clyde Bank and three in America um, around the Gulf of Maine. And, as you can see from this uh, slide here, the next round will combine bioregions from across the northern arc of the Atlantic. And the aim of this programme then is to create a story of place with a view to accelerating uh, transformative change, so the really fundamental changes to systems that we need. And the process focuses on understanding global issues at a bioregion in scale and understanding the local dynamics of a bioregion in the context of global trends. So it's simultaneously looking out at the bigger picture, whilst also turning the lens back inward and looking in on the local context. Um, and it's inspired by many forms of indigenous mapping. So bioregion in mapping then is a participatory process, working with communities. The boundaries of the bioregion are determined by those who are living there, those participating in the uh, mapping process. And what participants do is they identify topics and issues that are relevant to their region and gather information from various sources to build up a picture of the place and its development or, or changes over time. I mean, it literally is developing a story of the region. So the process then builds up layers of information, combining ecological and physical information with social and cultural information. So as well as mapping um, the physical landscape, it's about understanding who or what inhabits those landscapes, understanding the power relations and governance structures within and between these different layers or systems. So you start by mapping the past then so that you can understand how you've got to where you are in, in the present in order to think about um, how you can map the future. So what challenges um, you anticipate, what uh, do you want to change um, and where you want to be in the short, medium and long term. So this is trying to um, empower people, or give people the, the information that they need to, to not just be reactive to change, but actually to sort of um, uh, manipulate you, you like that change in the first place so to, to, to take people where they would like to be. So bioregion in Tayside, of which I am a member, and I think a few people on this call are as well, emerged from the first of the international workshops. So Tayside bioregion in mapping is something that's in progress, and in fact, it probably will continue to be in progress. I mean, this is a, an active living kind of uh, uh, approach to take to, to, to look to being a part of, of the environment that you, you live in. And um, it reflects all aspects. So at the moment, as you can see, the, the key's a little small, but hopefully you can see that it's covering um, energy, woodland, food, soil, water, placemaking, and wellbeing. So these are the initial um, topics to emerge. I suspect over time these may change or, or develop as, as um, we bring more information together. And one food initiative that's part of this bioregion in that I'm uh, connected to is, is Campy Growers. So Campy Growers um, is based on the site of the former Dundee Council Nursery at, at Camperdown Park and for those of you who know the region you can see where we are located on the map there. So Campy Growers then aim to create a community market garden education and therapeutic space. We're currently all volunteers and we've only had access to the site since May 2021. But in that time, we've already cleared and planted nine beds um, and we've had an abundance of produce. And I just want to say that the image of the produce is not stock footage here. These are gen this is a genuine image of, of um, the produce that we've grown on site and we've had some fantastic harvests recently. So the, the produce that we've, we've created as uh, grown has already been shared amongst the volunteers, um, but we've also already had a surplus. Um, which we've been sharing with uh, three community larders and a local community group for people with learning disabilities. 
Um, and we've got big ambitions for the site. We will eventually take over the running of it. So the council have secured funding for a purpose built facility um, and we've recently submitted two grant applications, uh, one to provide a development worker and the other to try and get our polytunnels recovered, which as you can see on the image are in a pretty uh, poor state at the moment. But what this will do is allow us to expand our growing space and also extend our growing season. <clears throat> and what we aim to do is change behaviour through demonstrating um, the required change in the food system, uh, promoting food security and sovereignty. And we also aim to tackle inequalities through the provision of free or low cost food and also by training that we want to put um, to develop around um, an education in horticulture and cooking skills amongst um, other activities that, that, we, that we have planned for the future. So I appreciate I've taken us on a bit of an arc there uh, and took, you know, to, to get us into the food system, but just to kind of summarise where I'm coming from, you know, we know that we need behavioural change for, to, for humanity to survive. And, you know, let's not underestimate this. We're not saving the planet. The planet will survive without us. In fact, it would probably be better off if we weren't around. Everything that we do in terms of our changing is, is for the survival of humanity. And the changes that we um, are needed require a shift in mindsets so that we can explore new possibilities and ways of doing things. And subjective well-being is an important part of this process. We need to have a certain level of distress about the damage that we're doing to the environment, but also having um, a higher level of well-being as well, that, that sense of hope and self-esteem that motivates us into action. But the changes that we put in place need to be relevant and they need to be manageable. And for me, this is where community led initiatives can be extremely effective. If we think about food systems in a new way, linking community distribution with the vast amount of community growing uh, across the city, um, for me, I think uh, offers huge potential in Dundee to address uh, problems around food, food uh, growing and food distribution. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Beverly. That was um, incredibly, incredibly informative and and really and really um, mind broadening. Um, I, I noted there's some some interesting questions on there. I'll take chair's privilege and maybe save the the question around population increase to sort of the panel discussion. I'll put that towards all of the speakers. Um, there is one comment here, Beverly, about um, is community larder just another name for a food bank, and is this just an attempt to remove the stigma? Um, no, it isn't. Um, a community larder is um, is a space where um, uh, people can make food donations. A lot of um, supermarkets and, and, and such like um, donate their food to the larder and basically anybody can, can, can turn up and take food from a food larder, whereas a food bank is a very specific um, thing that you have to be referred to. Um, you have to, there's a certain amount of means testing. I mean, I, I'm not an expert in food larders, but I believe you're only allowed to have sort of three uh, trips to a food larder over a six six month period. I don't know if that's changed recently, but a, a community larder is is just that. It's run by volunteers. Um, you know, maybe only up certain hours of the day, but anybody can go at any time and take any food that is there. Great. Uh, and then here's a question um, around, you know, with, with the sort of disruptions, I'm sure with the pandemic, but as well with just the disrupt disruptions of the supply chain to supermarkets, are you seeing this sort of greater take up and interest in community growing and community larders? Um, I guess from I'm your in perspective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, it's, as I said, my my area of expertise is about people's well-being and attitudes, behaviour. The, the 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 food side, the community growing side, is just sort of a, a well, a personal interest of mine, but something I want to develop as well. But yes, I I do believe at the beginning of the pandemic that actually trying to buy seeds was very difficult because people were. Um, stocking up and buying seeds um, and I think the the, the the supply chain issue actually uh, the, the community um, larder that's the one that's uh, um, up just up the road from me in Perth Road actually had to close the other day because um, there wasn't enough food being supplied because the the food wasn't coming into the supermarkets and they weren't having the excess and it wasn't it wasn't going out to the community larder so so yeah I mean it demonstrates how these things are all interconnected which is why we really need to have the ability to understand how things link up um, and how we we need to think about different more diverse more local ways of supporting ourselves through through food growing um, uh, to, to overcome these kind of uh, short term or, or very local or to avoid being um, uh, affected by these uh, issues that, that go on at a, at a broader societal scale if we can become more self-sufficient on a local scale. Couldn't agree more. Thank you, Beverly. I think at this point we'll we'll move um, to Pre Professor Jenny McDermott and then we'll bring up some of this discussion back together for the panel discussion. So 
without further ado, I, I look forward to um, Professor McDermott's talk. Okay, well, thank you very much. So I'm going to come at this as a slightly different um, perspective in terms of uh, the food system. So looking at uh, what we've talked about, the environmental impacts, but also think about what the implications are for nutrition. So while we can talk about we need to look at this, we need to sort of uh, think about uh, health as well. So um, the things we've got coming together here is we've got poor diet related health. So we've got overnutrition, we've got undernutrition, we've got malnutrition. Malnutrition is quite often thought of in terms of micro micronutrient deficiencies. So we've got all of this happening already in the world, but also we've now got the impact of climate change in terms of food security um, and what we're going to be able to do in the future. On top of that, we've got population growth. And if you're familiar with the sustainable development goals, food fits into every single one of the sustainable development goals. So if we can get a food system that's sustainable and healthy, then we're sort of making good progress towards achieving the sustainable development goals. Uh, next slide, please. So this is really just to give you an overview of what the food system looks like. It's incredibly complicated. It's going right from uh, agricultural production, as um, Derek was talking about, through to um, consumer behaviour that, that Beverly was talking about. And there's an awful lot that goes on in the middle. So. Uh, Quite often we think about if we have sustainable, healthy agricultural production, we end up with a healthy diet and that isn't always the case. Uh, next slide. So um, Derek will like this. Uh, so we grow lots of uh, very good quality potatoes in Scotland. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but by the time we eat it, they're not desperately healthy because a lot of the times we eat crisps, we eat chips. So this is just an example of where we have a very healthy product that we should be consuming. But actually, once it's worked its way through the food system, we maybe end up with something that's less healthy. And this is why it's really important to think of all of this as a food system um, and what happens along the way and what are the feedbacks of it. Um, and so much work so far has forgotten that bit in the middle. We talk about agriculture and we look at consumption. We've got to think of all of this. So think about this as I'm going through the talk. And the other thing is we have a global food system. Uh, the map on the right hand side is just showing some trade of different types of food. So we've got to remember this is a global food system. Next slide, please. So what impact um, does the food system have? Um, this graph here is showing um, greenhouse gas emissions from the food system. So the food sector accounts for about 26% of all um, greenhouse gases globally. Um, the majority of that come from production, so about 82% up to the farm gate. Um, and a lot of that, sort of a high proportion of that is from livestock, as sort of we know, hence all the recommendations to try and reduce meat consumption. But what's interesting is a lot of people have focused very much on packaging and transport in the food system. But these actually relatively contribute a very small amount to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, that's not dismissing them. We still need to look at alternative ways of um, packaging to get away from plastic, but they're not the, the main things that uh, are going to have the greatest impact in terms of our food system. Next slide, please. And just thinking about food miles, this is a really interesting one. People automatically think about food miles, the distance food travels, and this is what's um, one of the big important things in terms of our food system. But interestingly, um, the person, Professor Tim Lang, who came up with the term food miles, it had nothing to do with um, uh, environment, biodiversity or things like this. It was really about trying to reconnect people in terms of food and culture. Where does the food um, come from? Um, but it also became very quick, sort of easy way to sort of think about the environment. But the reason that the problem with it really is it's not the distance it travels, it's the mode of transport. So if it's travel, obviously, if it's air freighted, then the environmental impact is enormous. But actually less than 1% uh, of our food is uh, air freighted. Um, most of it is shipped internationally. Um, and interestingly, the most, if you're just totting up the number of miles uh, a food travels and sort of what our footprint is in terms of that, um, about 80% of the food miles in the UK are people driving to the supermarket. So if we're actually just saying it's the distance, then 
we're contributing most by driving to and from supermarkets regularly. So I think the important thing here is saying that it's about the mode of transport. Next slide, please. And this is just really to illustrate this. This is a study that was um, done a number of years ago. and It was looking at um, using production systems in the UK and in Spain and then transporting uh, these are tomatoes. And the model they had in the UK were using gr heated greenhouses, which weren't very efficient, um, which is the uh, green bar. Um, and in Spain, they were being produced without the need for heat. Um, and then being transported to the UK. And what you can see is because of the production system being used at the time uh, in the UK, actually the carbon footprint of um, producing them in the UK was much higher than producing them and then transporting them. Going back to what Derek was saying, um, systems are changing. So uh, we can reduce what's happening here in the UK in the way that we produce it. But this is just really to illustrate that food miles can be a little bit misleading. Next slide. Um, and I think most people will be aware of this. This is looking at uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with different food commodities. So fruit, um, if we go up the scale, you've got fruit, crops, beans, pulses, fish and livestock, um, particularly ruminants, where you're seeing um, greenhouse gas emissions associated with these commodities increasing. Um, and one of the things that we've sort of, I guess, are being questioned about or sort of people are questioning is it's not a single figure. Livestock, particularly ruminants, will always have the highest environmental impact because they're producing methane. Um, next slide, please. But what this graph is showing is actually the wide distributions of emissions that you can have using different farm systems. So if you look at the very top in purple, that's beef. So we take an average quite often to what um, we think greenhouse gas emissions, but actually it does vary on what the production system is. Um, it's still, as I say, if we're looking at changing our diets, this is where we need to look at changing. But it's to just to make the point, which probably fits in with what Derek was saying, is a lot of it depends on the production system that we've got. Next slide, please. And what do we actually need to do in terms of our food system? This is um, a study that was just published recently. And basically, if we're looking at uh, our carbon budget for um, 1.5 or 2 degrees, that if we carry on as we're going at the moment, the food system could account for all of the carbon budget um, by the end of the century. So this means that we can't do anything other than produce food and eat it, uh, which is obviously unrealistic. So what they did was they looked at different scenarios, um, some, some diet base, some production based. So looking at healthier diets, eating no more calories than you need, so no overconsumption. Um, and you can see this will bring this down slightly, but we're still not getting down to the um, 1.5 degree of warming. Production can help reduce it, but that alone isn't. So the main point here really is we've got to change the food system from diet and production. Just focusing on one or the other isn't going to get us to where we need to, need to be in terms of uh, reducing our carbon footprint. Next slide, please. So we talk very much around sort of nutrition, climate change, about sustainable diets. And this is a definition that um, was produced by the FAO in 2010. And basically it's saying it's got to be environmentally sustainable, it's got to be healthy, um, but it's also got to be culturally accessible, uh, acceptable, accessible, economically fair. And I think some of these things that we don't think about quite so much when we're talking about what is a healthy diet or what is a sustainable diet is we don't bring some of these aspects in. And I think this is causing some of the barriers to um, changing our, our diet because we're just thinking about make it healthy, make it environmentally sustainable. Next slide. And interestingly, we think about all this just happening recently, but it was back in 1986 that a paper was published basically saying that we can't make food choices just on our health. We've got to do things to protect the environment. In 1998, the same author um, talked about where have we got so far with guidelines? And the answer was really nowhere. 
And it wasn't until 2019 that the WHO and FAO came together, which was quite unique, and published um, guidelines for sustainable diets. So just to see, this isn't something that's all new and we've suddenly realised. It's just taken a very, very long time for it to come a little bit more mainstream. Next slide. So if we're talking about health and environment, these diagrams here are looking at different food um, commodities and the further they are out from the centre, essentially the worse they are. So on the left hand side, you've got health. On the right hand side, you've got environment um, and you've got things like red meat, which we would expect to be outside for most of them. But there's some interesting ones like nuts, for example, up in the top right hand corner where they're part of dietary guidelines, so they're viewed as healthy. They don't have a particularly high um, greenhouse gas emissions associated with them, but they have a very high water um, demand. So we're having to, it's, the difficulty of diets is bringing all these together. So if you look at the uh, diagram that says all food, this is what the diet looks like. It's a real mess. It isn't just looking at single commodities. We then need to move this over to sort of saying, well, what happens when you put them all together? and um, what is the overall health and environmental impact? Next slide. Um, and so if we take all these different commodities and we plot them on a graph, looking at the average environmental impact against the relative risk of um, mortality, you can see that red, un, uh, processed red meat and unprocessed red meat are at the top there for health and environment, which wouldn't surprise us. Um, and there's a reasonably good relationship with the others. You can see nuts there that doesn't quite fit. Um, next slide. So what I've highlighted here is uh, grain. And while the environmental impact isn't hugely different, there's obviously a little bit more um, processing needed for the refined grain. What you're seeing is there is a difference between health. The um, refined grains are less healthy than whole grain. So this is why we really need to look at these two together. We can't sort of rely on environment alone or nutrition alone. We really need to make sure these two areas come together so we don't end up giving recommendations that conflict or actually have negative consequences either on health or the environment. Next slide, please. And meat is a big area. So sort of this is the thing that we're all being sort of uh, recommended to reduce. There was recent guidelines actually quantifying how much we should reduce. So this is sort of stimulated a huge sort of uh, industry in trying to find replacements. So we've got lab meat at the top here. Um, the middle one is insects. This was from a restaurant that somebody I know went to. So you can have your ants on a bit of tomato if that appeals. Um, and then you've got your beans and pulses and things like that. And they're all being badged as protein alternatives. We need to find protein alternatives. Next slide. I don't like that because we need food replacements. We don't need protein replacements. Are we short of protein? Next slide, please. No is the answer. So these are uh, this was a study that was done on large populations in America, in the UK and in France, and it was looking at the protein intake of uh, vegans in blue, vegetarians in orange and uh, omnivores in grey. And the line going across the dotted line is roughly the um, requirement for protein in the diet. And what you can see is in all countries looking at vegan diets, vegetarian diets, they were all still above the uh, requirement for protein. So I think this is one of the real problems is a barrier where people keep talking about protein replacements when in fact what we're looking for is food replacements because this is fueling a big problem in people changing their diets because people are concerned that they'll become protein deficient if they eat less meat. Um, and we all over, well, most of us over consume um, protein by almost twice that we need. So removing all meat from the diet um, will not it cause any form of protein deficiency. You get protein in, in things like wheat um, and sort of vegetables, etc. So you still get your protein um, uh, intake if you were to reduce your meat consumption. Next slide, please. So what does a plant rich diet look like? Um, it's not vegetarian, it's not vegan. Um, 
it's looking at reducing um, meat and dairy consumption. And these are just two examples of diets that were published. The one on the left hand side was something called Eat Lancet. And this was uh, badged as a healthy diet from a sustainable food system. Um, and on the right hand side was the study we did about 10 years ago, which was the very first one to ask the question, can you have a healthy diet that will be have lower greenhouse gas emissions? Um, and the answer is yes, you can. This was just the food that uh, what we modelled this, and this is what a diet would look like for a week uh, spread out on this table. Um, so there isn't a prescriptive diet. Sort of, you can make combinations of any foods that you you would want, um, and with certain constraints, you can create your own diets. So. We need to be thinking really about this. How do we make sure that nutrition and environment are linked together? Next slide. So just really sort of summing this up, um, I'm interested to see the way that we're moving in terms of plant based diets. So um, traditional plant based diets, if we think about so traditionally what vegetarians, vegans ate, it was a lot of whole grain, it was a lot of pulses, a lot of fruit and veg. If you look at a lot of the studies, uh, vegetarians tend to be healthier than um, non-vegetarians. They not just in their diet, but also in their lifestyles, which is a slightly different thing. But I'm really interested to see what's happening with the modern day um, plant based diets, because we're seeing more and more processed foods, more and more packaging. This is just a few examples of what's on the market now. Um, and what does this mean for health? Um, many of these are ultra processed foods, um, which means they tend to be high in sugar, fat, salt. Uh, we did a study a couple of years ago where we compared um, the nutrient composition of um, vegan food versus the equivalent of uh, a meat based food. So we had, um, say, a meat lasagna against a plant lasagna. And while the the plant based one was slightly healthier. Um, they were still 25% of them were still red labeled in salt um, and high in things like fat and sugar. So I think going back to my original point, this is where we really need to make sure we're looking at these two things in parallel because um, while all these foods are being produced and the reason they're being produced because we want to make them more convenient. People said that the um, barriers were the fact they didn't know how to cook. Um, so the market is responding to this, but we need to make sure that we're not going down a route which is potentially going to end up unhealthy and we've got to try and um, backtrack on. Um, and just one final point on this slide, the one in the middle is uh, something that is smashed avocado and it's advertised as if you're short of time, then it can save you a few minutes, potentially injury, injuries um, rather than struggling to get the stone out. I mean, avocado comes in quite good packaging anyway, and so we don't need to actually maybe wrap it in plastic and how much time it really saves, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, next slide, please. So if I can just finish on remind us, reminding us about the food system, we've got everything from agriculture through to supply chains, through to food um, manufacturing, to retail, and all of these have got to have feedback loops. We can't just have it as a linear process going from agriculture all the way through uh, to nutrition. We need to be feeding back because we know that um, our diets are going to have to take change in terms of climate change, but also what we're producing is going to be affected by changes in the climate. Um, so I'll finish there um, and we can move on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. That was I, I just I just need to comment that of the three of all three speakers that, you know, clearly people have a you know, you each have your expertise, but have really had to learn a lot about other about other um, disciplines as well. And so, it's, you know, it's, it's a really, really amazing um, combination of, of experience and, and expertise we have. Um, I'm just cognizant a bit of the time, so I was just going to I'm going to maybe transition a bit to the panel discussion, but start with some questions for you. Jenny, if that's okay, and kind of um, it's been coming up a bit in in the um, in the questions and the comments, which is sort of around um, you know like this idea of these these misconceptions that the public has, and I was just wondering if you know I mean, you've talked touched on them a bit already, but sort of these really pervasive misconceptions around diets and climate change, and you know what kind of impacts do uh, you think they're having, sort of I guess people's health as well as yeah. environmentally. Well, I think I touched on probably the one that. Uh, uh, 
I'm frustrates me as much is the high, whole idea around protein. Um, the industry are pushing everything on protein. Um, apparently, someone told me the other day that you only have to have 12% protein in a product to call it high protein. Um, so the, the industry is sort of fueling this. And um, from work that we've done uh, in the past, both with adults and children, one of their concerns about changing their diet is that they'd be protein deficient. Um, and I think um, there's an awful lot of academic sort of language that we use to say we're looking for protein replacements. Um, perhaps we could start looking at uh, um, food replacements as a term. Um, as a nutritionist, I'm more concerned about making sure we get sufficient iron in the diet by reducing red meat. Um, a lot of women are marginally iron deficient, so that is much more important to me than worrying about protein. I mean, if you want to call them something, I would say, let's say iron replacement foods. Um, so I think there's that sort of uh, misconception. I think there's a lot of things around um, social identity. Sort of people don't want to necessarily be seen to being vegetarian or vegan. They have very you know, particular identities. It was interesting about eight, nine years ago when people were really starting to push the flexitarian concept. Um, there was an organisation um, charity that set up that really focused on men because men didn't like the word flexitarian. It didn't sound very macho and they didn't want to be associated with it. So they set up a charity called Part Time Carnivores, exactly the same idea of diets and men signed up to it. Um, so I think there's a lot of things that we need to do to try and get over sometimes the language, you know, plant based. I think, the, you know, another misconception is a plant based diet is vegetarian or vegan, which it isn't. None of the recommendations are saying we should stop eating meat. The recommendations are all we should reduce it. Um, so I think there's definitely some confusion in the language that's being used. And I think as academics, we can be blamed for some of that. Um, and so those those just would be the, you know, two of the things I would think about immediately. Great, yeah, I, I, exactly. And I think that sort of also weaves into a bit of the, the themes that, that um, uh, Beverly was talking about. And um, and I'm just, I just wanted to, to pivot a bit to, um, to uh, Derek Stewart, if that's okay, Professor Stewart, um, sort of following up on this question around, there's been a few questions in here looking at the idea of, um, well, sort of what policies. So, I mean, you, you went over so many exciting technologies and, and really innovative, um, you know, approaches and, and methods for, uh, you know, maybe like updating our, our agriculture. Do you, do you see, I guess, kind of two questions in a way. Do you see the need for, for government and policies to really be supporting this shift at, at a larger scale? Um, and if we're kind of also thinking about, you know, food access and food equality, you know, do you have a sense of what kind of difference in price these kinds of products might be and, and you know, would, would they still be quite accessible? I mean, I, I can come at this, the price side is an interesting one because I can come at that because I work with industry a lot. They're not aiming for a higher price product. They're aiming to, to supplement what's in the market already. So the price point would be the same, but they will be more profitable because their systems are more efficient. Um, so purely on an economic basis, I think it would work that way. Um, I have a concern when they say let the market decide because if you look in your supermarket now, you can see what's happening. The market means prices are just going to rocket. I was looking at something in the BBC there. Chicken prices are about to rocket now as well. Um, so the, the market is volatile. Um, there's the elements of national food security. I mean, I, I suspect Jenny and I uh, and Beverly would have different ideas on what a, a national food security proportion should be. Um, I think if you went to some of Boris's supporters, they would say we need to be 100% food secure. Unfortunately, food is an internationally traded commodity and business doesn't work like that. And in fact, as far as I know, we don't grow pineapples in the UK yet, so you can't be food secure in that. Um, but these new technologies coming through offer a way to bolster food security. And, and bear in mind that your producers are businesses. So um, the farmers are really interested in these new technologies because they're getting pushed to deliver more sustainable production on, on absolute environmental sustainability. <clears throat> so if they're growing, for example, lettuces outside, probably on peatlands, they can't do that anymore if you want to hit the target. So how are you going to do it? Are you going to import everything from Spain then? 
Yeah, well, they'll, which means you'll have to pay a lot more, but we've got the tools and technologies if you want to support them that we can do it here. And actually we could put these food production sites on sites that are brownfield. Um, so if you, and this is where you start to link up different areas. I was reading the report by the, the British Architectural Society. They're saying stop building new buildings. You've got existing buildings, you've got lots of them, repurpose them. We could use old buildings and put food production systems in them. Uh, we can actually strip significant amounts of heat and energy from the sewer system. The, sewer, the water in a sewer system in urban areas is significantly warmer than it would be in the rural areas. So we can strip that heat out of there and start producing food right where it's needed, next door. Um, and again, it's, it's going back to the uh, it's not it's not thinking about food as something isolated. Food's something that's integrated through our culture and society. So it then needs to inform how you build new um, new housing schemes, for example. So it, it's it, it's like a thread on a jumper. When you start to pick food there, it just unravels into so many other contributing areas. No, well, exactly. And these are all really exciting points and I and I guess I mean in terms of like back of the envelope do you feel that that, that this could scale you know for the likes of, of Scotland or do you think again it'll, it'll be more of a supplement um, replacing no, what I think we it currently scale significantly uh, and, and you can democratize it so the the technologies can be held by communities and that's where government can make it, could come in and help the community invest into that and create a community-based system for producing food particularly in areas like on the west coast or in the islands or in Orkney where they They've got really interesting renewable energy products that, where they can often produce more energy than is needed. So that energy can then be channeled into producing food. Um, I don't know, these, these green salad foods, particularly in midwinter when uh, exporting them out there becomes problematic because the ferry just doesn't go. Um, right. Yeah, they, they yeah. Security. Excellent. And, and just, just while I have you, because you did bring up a uh, population in your presentation and there was a question around you know, shouldn't shouldn't we be addressing population growth globally? I know it's been, sorry if it's unfair to ask you that, but I don't know if you have any any thoughts you wanted to share. Um, I think most of the obvious answers to population growth come back to limitation on what well, people need need to. Well, there's a cultural based thing. Um, for example, if you go to sub-Saharan Africa, where basically um, the I'm probably the worst one to talk about this one. The child death more mortality is high, so they tend to have more children. The culture is that the 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 kids then look after the parents. They they need to create uh, if if it's a subsistence life, you need more kids to then farm the land, that type of thing. I get worried we start to adopt that mentality of colonialism. You shouldn't be having that many kids. Type thing. Well, we can't afford to do that. Um, but I think the the FAO and who. Um, I've done a lot of work looking at how do we control population. It's how do you embed that in that is equitable? Well, exactly, answers. yeah. And and and, oh. and from from oh, is anyone? Yeah, please. Someone yeah, Alex, do you mind if I answer that? Please, please, please. So, yeah, I mean, I, I've, this question's emerged once before, and people saying yeah, we need to, the the thing is to challenge to attack um, address population growth first. The problem is that's going to take too long. We don't have time to wait to change the population. We have to act now, so we have to change the way that we, our own expectations on our own behaviour. We we have to do that now. Waiting for population to change or, or addressing population growth would take at least a generation to come into effect. We don't have that time to wait for that. Yes, I agree. Uh, Jenny, did you want to jump in at all from a? Yes. I feel obliged. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> I agree completely with what's been said. Um, and I also sort of think it dodges the fact that uh, when we talk about sub-Saharan Africa or places like that, um, we, it dodges the fact that we in higher income countries, where there may be fewer of us, we're the ones who have the greatest environmental impact. What we're doing, what we're choosing to do is where the sort of uh, really big high impacts are. And as Beverly says, we don't have time to wait a generation or sort of however long, you know, we need to be looking within the high income countries and say, what are we going to do and how are we going to make these changes rather than saying, you know, it's just about population growth. Yeah, exactly. And and, and just to offer, you know, my experience more sort of environmental science and, and you know, with some of my colleagues as demographers, we are actually show, seeing that the the um, human population is plateauing. You know, our, our growth rate is, is slowing. Uh, and interestingly, one of the most influential effects on that is actually educating women and, and you know, 
allowing more opportunities for women um, actually does, you know, slow slow birth rates and and or yeah, and so women are having fewer children further apart, and that you know that is already having a visible impact globally. So um, so just to say, yeah, it it is certainly there's lots of us, but um, we don't have to. We can see that as an opportunity rather than a, a challenge. Um, I wanted to to go back to Beverly, if that's all right. Um, next, there was a great question um, around uh, how to uh, improve subjective well-being at the community level. And I don't know if you had some thoughts you wanted to share. Yeah, I, d I did see that question. Thank you for that. Um, it's, um, I think the question was, are there any examples, aren't there, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, that we sorry, can use? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and the thing is, actually, that there isn't a great deal in many respects, because um, it's particularly if you, you're looking at it from an academic perspective, what happens is you get embroiled in these discussions about what is community. And also where there are initiatives to um, advance well-being, they tend to be either um, done at an individual level, or where they are done at community level, they tend to be um, communities based on certain characteristics of people. And it tends to be people who um, are maybe having difficulties in some way, whose, whose well-being is particularly low because, um, I don't know, maybe they've, they've got learning disabilities, um, people who are, are coming out of um, perhaps a, a prison environment or, or this kind of thing. They, they, the the well-being initiatives tend to be focused on very specific groups. There's very little work that's done on um, sort of the well-being of, of everybody. And I mean, and for me, we, you know, this is, I like the concept of well-being because it isn't stigmatising. It, it is, it affects all of us. All of us will benefit from an increase in well-being. Um, and what we are finding, I think, is that there are kind of, there are groups and initiatives that are starting to emerge um, where people are thinking about um, what contributes to their well-being in different communities. But again, they're very localised. Um, so it depends what the, what the community uh, feel is important and a lot of it is driven by sort of very um, uh, tends to be driven by individuals very people who are very keen and very motivated so unfortunately there isn't I can't answer this question say yes go to this place you'll find everything you need to know I mean it just isn't there yet but I think we'll get in there I think people are working on it and I, I'm hoping it will come to the fore sooner rather than later but great question thank you yeah, and I, and I think what's come up a lot, you know, sort of themes and in, in questions and in the answers is kind of, you know, this very locally relevant and, you know, solutions or or efforts we can be doing, you know, engaging with our community, sharing food with our community, all things that we sort of do naturally as sort of part of human society. And then having these, you know, um, larger scale sort of top down, uh, you know, impressions or, or you know, watching um, the whole food system, you know, and then there's some excellent questions here around, you know, how do we consider everything, deforestation, you know, pollinators, um, there's just, you know, th there's just so many sort of overwhelming, um, in some levels, considerations. So I guess if um, if I could ask, if I could just go around to all of the speakers and I'll, I'll can I start with Jenny, um, if we're thinking around just now kind of taking this bird's eye view and looking at thinking about international policies or, you know, the, the COP26 coming up, which is sort of, you know, what we're kind of using as an excuse to, to have this conversation um you know are, are you looking out for any um policy agreements or you know negotiations that that could be uh you know supporting or, or, help, or helpful uh, you think in terms of addressing the problems you've highlighted well first of all i'm really hoping food will be part of the conversation um, right, yes. <laughs> would be the first thing um so yes um and i think sort of agreements um around what the future food system would look like we've got to tackle not just food security but what sort of uh, is sort of we need to look at nutrition security because food security is making sure people don't go hungry but nutrition security makes sure that they get the right nutrients um, so i would like some sort of to see some sort of agreement of how we're going to work across sort of uh, particularly lower income countries to try and achieve some form of uh, nutrition security. Um, I think I would also like to see a discussion that really is linking up the food system. So I mean, maybe this is more of a local sort of national issue, but for example, if we're saying from a climate perspective, we need to reduce our meat consumption, how are we going to support farmers? What are we going to do? How are we going to help farmers transition potentially into something else? We know that some land isn't suitable for other things. So, you know, we can't just go out and say we want to change the diet and we want to do this. We've got to look to see, well, where do we change? How do we not put all, you know, livestock farmers out of business? Um, and that's a really crucial thing because I think 
sort of uh, sectors like that feel very threatened by all of this. Um, but talking once to the head of the NFU, they said, well, if you can make it viable to do something else, you know, farmers will change what they're doing. So I think um, from a COP perspective, I really hope food's on the agenda is the first thing. I really hope they're talking about food and nutrition security, um, but also then looking at how can we achieve this uh, across the world? Because one of the other issues is, as I think Derek mentioned, is as countries become wealthier, they switch their diet because certain foods become very much more of a status. So see it being seen to eat meat indicates that you have got money. Buying a Coke, the same. And what happens, we've seen it in every single country in the world that's developed, we end up with a very, very unhealthy and unsustainable food system as that happens. How we tackle that, I'm not sure, because again, coming in and saying, don't do what we do, um, exactly. is beyond patronising. So uh, I don't know if that answers it, but those are my my initial thoughts. No, those are great. Th thank you. Um, should I uh, ask the same question then to Derek? Do you mind? Um, what, what, what would you, was there anything you'd like to see in terms of, and you know, if, even if it's COP or sort of international uh, coordination on some of the issues you were, um, you were discussing? I think certainly with regard to food, uh, we need to integrate better with the energy systems, um, just full stop. Um, so even existing agriculture, you look at you, you look at a farmer and what's he driving? A diesel powered tractor. Um, so we, we have to change all of these systems if we're going to talk seriously about it. The government has to walk it like it talks it. Um, stop throwing money at new coal mines. Because um, credibility for my for my uh, thought for the UK government has just been blown out of the water by approving that one, although they're rescinding it, hopefully. Um, we need we need mission driven activities, not aspirations and words. And what the missions mean is we want to do X and each country then says, right, we're going to throw this amount of effort behind it. Um, now, that could be delivering to what Jenny was asking, asking for. Um, and setting these things like nutritional targets, I think would be fantastic. I mean, humans don't really vary much from the nutritional targets, but then become global. Um, I mean, they vary in size, clearly. I'm significantly bigger than many of the people who work here and wider, I may add. Um, but I think the nutritional target thing is quite interesting. But how we get to that and delivering people's nutritional requirements and where they are needs multiple different systems. And these systems need innovation to flourish, not just academics like us, but but working in with working in collaboration with the growers, probably with big industry, but small industry, um, and allowing these people to develop a life and a good quality of life. Yeah, no, thank you, Derek. That's ex excellent. Uh, Beverly, do you mind if I ask you that question as well? Is there any international coordination you'd like to see on these issues? Um, I'm probably the least qualified to discuss um, on that respect, but I do um, I do think local local small initiatives. I think um, I think governments. I want to stop governments and politicians from from focusing on their sort of their big huge vanity projects, because the the way that we're going to affect about change is is everybody if everybody can make small changes, that's where we're going to make a difference. And I think if there was on an international perspective. Um, what I think would be fantastic is if we could link together all the sort of community, local community growing initiatives across different continents and different places in the world, because then it makes you realise that even though you're doing something which, which may seem quite small, if you understand how this is being done across the globe, then you can have a big impact that way. And I'm hoping in that that would sort of kind of boost people um, and real, make them realise that actually your little thing is actually making a huge, huge difference. So the more people that we get involved in these local initiatives and the more that governments can do to help support that and take away all these stupid barriers and all these hurdles we have to go through to get the tiniest pots of money to do stuff that actually could be incredibly effective. Um, I think that would be the outcome that I would like to see. Oh, thanks, Beverly. So I, I, I think I will um, uh, just have a, a closing question or you know see if we can keep a discussion going between the speakers as well um but i i, uh, I was on the, the radio i think bbc radio scotland on on monday and I, and you know it was sort of the talking about this event and talking about the discussions we you know we were going to to have and and you know the the announcer was sort of like you know between uh the trade disruptions and the supply chain disruptions and now apparently climate change you know it, is it kind of are all these systems failing and, and are we all you know is this are we all sort of going down the down the tubes and I, and I guess I mean we've you know actively tried to choose speakers that were um 
you know, and, and experts that, that are, are offering, I think, a very, a very constructive and, and productive message. Um, but I, I just maybe starting with Beverly, just going around and, and, and talking about, you know, what would you say to those that are feeling a bit overwhelmed or, or um, you know, depressed, disheartened about the, the future of, of our society and food system? Um, well, for me, this is what underpins the well-being thing, isn't it? There are so many people who understand what we need to do, who are working really, really hard. I, I, I'm fortunate to be connected in some big international communities of people who are in very high, powerful positions um, and they know the changes that need to be made and they're making them. So I would say don't give up hope. Hope it's, it's coming. We're getting there um, and uh, just stay positive and connect with the connect with the people who are feeling positive as well. And anybody who's been a naysayer, just just don't listen to them. Stick to the people who are being positive and grow your communities together. We're, we, we can do this. It will happen. Beverly, should I, can I move to, to Jenny? Would you like to, to answer that question? Yes, I think sort of uh, agree with that. And also sort of, I keep going back to the whole food system. Everybody's got a responsibility here. Um, and it's very easy to say, oh, these are all the problems. These are all, you know, it's not working, et cetera. Um, there's some very good work that's going on. So I think we should be highlighting that more. Um, and I think across the food system, you know, individuals are usually targeted as it's up to you to do it. But I think there's a responsibility across the whole food system um, to sort of help make this happen. Um, and I think we can. And I think some of the doom and gloom is the fact that people are sort of being told you must do, you mustn't do and all of this. And we've got to think about how we do this, because some of the things we're saying aren't very attractive um, for people to do. Uh, so I think trying to speak more positively about it as opposed to the doom that, you know, we're all facing. It's not undermining sort of what's ahead of us. Um, so. I think that's where trying to engage sort of people who aren't engaged at the moment is, you know, what we're going to need to do. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, Derek, would you like to offer any positive uh, views for the future? Yeah, we're following from what Jenny said. We face challenges, but these challenges, we can best them. Um, you have never seen an innovation platform, whether it's technology, approaches, financial systems, regenerative agriculture, you've never seen transformation like it since the last 10 years. The innovation is there, the work is there to change things. If someone's doom and gloom, don't take your advice from Facebook. Speak to, speak to a scientist. We're happy to speak to you. We've got the evidence. Facebook's got a nice meme they've picked up of Twitter. Go to the evidence base, chat to us. That's what we're here for. We'll hold your hand and show you the way forward. Yep, and I would just add to that, politicians and policy listen to us too. <laughs> yes, well, exactly, exactly. I mean, I think that there's been, there's hopefully a lot, a lot of uh, um, food for thought. I mean, sorry for the pun, but you know, and 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 opportunities to be funding some really, you know, pushing and 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 championing some really exciting, uh, and and constructive, and I hope empowering, um, efforts. You know, in 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 this space, and and I, you know, I just really, I want to, I want to thank the the. The panel of speakers so much. I mean, it was it was really such a such an exciting and 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 positive um, series of talks. I think the the questions were you know really great. I thank the audience and and the other moderators for really asking um, an amazing range of questions. So I think I think we got we got a good uh, you know hour and a half worth um, of insights from our from our experts. So just to thank everybody and hope you enjoy the rest of your Thursday afternoon. Thanks very much. <laughs>